I think we've got time for a discussion. Of course you have. So, uh, do you want to like say anything? Tracy, um, in the UK then, as, as UK citizens, politically, what do we do? Well, look on Via Campesina's website and look at their common agricultural policy critique because you've got one of the most important tools which are being discussed now, which is how do we fund our farmers to be feeding us into the future sustainably. And as usual, the lobby is enormous. But at the moment, the head of the commission is called Dacian Chalas, and he's actually a Romanian farmer and farmer family, and he even worked in an organic farm. And he says he's trying very hard to give benefits to small-scale family diverse farmers because they're not rewarded by the market, because in their product, the costs are internalised, whereas in this mass-produced system, the real costs are externalised all the time and yet they're still getting subsidies to continue to externalise. So we need to actually protect and give more subsidies to the small-scale farmers. But he says that the lobby in Brussels for the big agrochemical agribusiness companies is... It's, it's just enormous. He, he's just pounded down the whole time when he tries to up the importance of small-scale farming. And I'm afraid to say that's the same thing that's happening to our politicians. I mean, like Jim Pierce. Jim Pace? Jim Pace. Jim Pace. I mean, so, Caroline Spellman, who's our Minister for Agriculture, is married to and was co director of an agrochemical lobby group. I mean, so, it's a revolving door between government and big business. So, is the answer then, then as far as Brussels goes, UKIP? Is what? what UKIP. You give yeah. yeah. And the Green Party, I would have thought. Mm. The Greens. Yeah. Yeah. Where the Greens are this? Well, certainly the British Greens are completely with us, and especially in the, the MEPs and the MPs, I mean, Caroline Lucas and Keith Taylor and people in Brussels. They're 100% <coughs> for small scale farmers. And with the um, Via Campesina and what's called the Food Sovereignty Common Agricultural Policy Team, which is a, a kind of group of 380 farm group representatives across Europe. They're all saying, stop this ridiculous system where every single farm gets subsidies and actually just ensure that the farm gate, at the farm gate, the farmer gets the proper price for him to produce in whatever region he's producing, a real price, and reduce the size of the farms so that you don't have these massive systems, spread the farms throughout the EU, not have them concentrated. I mean, Smithfield wanted to make Poland their Iowa of Europe, in other words, covered in factory farms. So the neoliberal government that welcomed them in, you know, probably very much advised by the IMF, they realised their mistake and they've been closing the doors and regulations on Smithfield. And Smithfield the other day, Paul, he was, he's called um, Paulson, he said, Smith, um, the Polish government, it, and compared to the Romanian government, is like night and day. You know, the Romanian government are, are wonderful with us, and the Polish government are horrendous, because they're saying, you cannot behave like this anymore. So they've gone to Romania, and the Romanians are still being very nice to them. One thing strikes me is that <clears throat> it, it, it's necessary to do the kind of thing that Tracy is talking about and ex attack and expose these big companies. And it's necessary to engage with the, uh, the CAP because they're very big and all that, and with government. But the most important thing of all is, is I reckon, to re recreate a different way of farming in situ, which is what we're calling renaissance. Now, for example, in this country, there are fewer than half a million farmers left. It's quite hard to pin down the figure, but it's about 1% of the total workforce. And um, no, it's not, it can't be 1% of the total population. And we actually, in order to farm in the kind of ways we're all talking about, where, you know, more complicated, etc., 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 you probably need, in this country, three or four times as many farmers as we now have. 
So we need to recreate at, at somewhere or other another million or so farmers or a million and a half, basically out of nowhere. Now the people that want to do that, we have very good evidence are already out there. It isn't, you know, it's, it's a job that many people find tremendously attractive. The help from the government is absolutely zero for the kind of reasons that Trace is talking about. You know, they are basically an extension of the corporate board, board uh, in a boardroom. But there's lots of, even without, as it were, total land reform, there's lots of landowners out there who would like to get more people onto their land. It's, you know, although there's lots of regulations in the right way, just as there are, as Pete said, with chicken feed, you know, planning permission to set up place, all that kind of stuff. But the point is, it's got to be, I think, it's got to be a people's movement. People at large taking matters into our own hands. Because if we try to engage with government, we spend all our energies engaging with government, spend all our energies in engaging with corporates, then, as Pete says, we'll still be here in 10 years time having the same conversation. So could I make the point there that, I mean, I'm taking it up with Caroline Spellman, I hope. Um, one of the ways that non-farming people and young people with no money got into farming was through county council-owned farms. This government, and, and actually the last government as well, um, have, are selling them off. This government in particular is selling them off. Caroline Spellman said to me, oh, well, it's all part of the big society. It'll have to be a local decision. And, of course, Gloucestershire is now selling off most of its farms. Staffordshire are the good guys. They haven't sold any of their farms. But this is something we should take up locally. I don't know what Oxfordshire are doing. Probably the colleges over all the farmland. Um, no, in Oxfordshire. But uh, it's something we should look at because it's a way into farming that's being barred to people with no money mm. and you know basically you get a farm because your dad was in it mm. you, you know. would you like to introduce yourself just say who so, you are well i'm michael whale yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, anyone mickey whale well, they sing at qpr no um yeah. you're a writer yeah i'm yeah. a writer broadcaster and i i i, I fight fights about allotments mm. i fought the olympics I think it's a good idea if people introduce themselves. Do you yeah. mind saying who you are? Luke, don't assume. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, who do you want to say? But Jessica. Well, a really quick answer this will be, I think. You incorporate um, into your talk pigs and chickens, and presumably you're doing that because you want to do one of them really well, but cattle, do they come into the, your, your uh, traces? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, to a slightly lesser extent, because the, the um, cattle eat forage, so they don't require the same amounts of soil, but when, they're, when they go in to be milked, they'll get a concentrated feed, which will have a fair proportion of soil in, which means that they can yield ridiculous amounts of milk to the point where the, you know, the, the metabolism of the average dairy cow is being pushed to its absolute limits, and their life expectancy is falling, and their uh, ability to produce calves is, is falling. So. Yeah. I'll just say something. We, we, we are sorry. Uh, no, no, we we we, we want it. we want we want to get soya uh, sustain it. Yeah, so soya in the the form it's produced at the moment. Um, I mean, you can grow it in Europe, and in fact, there are people in this country who develop seeds for soya. But the you know the protein content of those of the soya produced is not as good as it is from South America. So uh, you need the high protein to get the performance of these highly inbred animals up to the level which required to make a living. And, and that all comes back to the farm gate price that Colin was talking about. So if the farmers are being pushed, the, the, their, their price for milk, their price for eggs or, or, or chickens is pushed right down, then they're forced into a, an intensive system. Uh, at least that's what they think. And um, that, that's the sort of uh, vicious circle we've got ourselves into. And it's how we actually break out of that vicious circle. I just want to say that we, we, Ruth and I campaign for real farming. We belong to a group called the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, and what's been happening: cattle and sheep traditionally are raised on grass or on browse, but mainly on grass. And if you look at Britain as a whole, our principal crop is grass. So we've got about 18, 15 million hectares of grass and about three million hectares of the rest. So grass is our thing. Two things have happened. First, grass used to be traditional pasture, i.e. what grew. That has largely been replaced by um, 
custom bred ryegrass, very, very high nitrogen content, huge runoff, all that stuff. That was the first assault of the agrochemical industry. Now we've got the stage where propaganda is being put round to the effect that grass-fed animals are bad because of the methane they produced. In fact, grassland, if it's properly managed, is, a, is, is probably a net carbon sink, so it's probably the opposite of the truth again. But um, nevertheless, the, the kind of pressure that Tracy's been talking about, the industrial pressure, there was a huge movement to put all cattle, basically all cattle, indoors, where they primarily will be fed on grain, or largely fed on grain, which again comes back to the agrochemical thing. Our greatest crop grass is being sidelined. It's the same rubbish. And whereas a traditional herd, um, we, we, you know, we probably have possibly 10, 20 cattle, which didn't make you a whole living, but made you a bit of a living. Now they're talking about thousands under one roof. And what Pete's talking about, you know, the very high yield, these modern Frisians or Holsteins, 2,000 gallons, 10,000 litres, whereas a traditional one will be half that, or less than half that, and a wild cow will be about a fifth of that. It's grotesque. But also you've got the problem where I had breast cancer and the oncologist, he said um, that my discipline doesn't often talk about this, but I, he actually believed that it's because we're drinking too much milk, because the milk is so high in hormones, and it's, he says it's not from injecting the cows regularly with hormones, it's because they're now made to be very high hormone performing animals to get that, those huge udders. And so, you know, the cappuccinos and the cafe lattes and the cream and the milk and the mm. cheese, we, we're, we're, we're drinking too much milk. Yeah. And it is having a huge impact, particularly on women with breast cancer. Organic milk, though. Well, if it's unpasteurized milk, it's completely mm. different milk and it's good for you. But this dead milk, mm. once it's pasteurized, it's just not good for you. And, you know, he was a very, very conventional oncologist. How can you tell what soya is bad for you and what soya is good for you? Well, soya it is, in the way it's produced at the moment, I would say is pretty bad, whether it's GM or non-GM. I think GM is degree slightly worse than non-GM, but the, if, if you want to, if, if you look at habitat destruction in South America, it happens whether it's GM or non-GM. Uh, the GM is... Uh, has more risks associated to it, with it, in my opinion, because of the intensive use of uh, glyphosate on it. Um, so I think we need to look at a different way of producing soya, where it is part of a rotation, uh, and it could easily be grown more in Europe, but because of historical trade agreements which were cooked up in the early 90s, um, we're limited how much oil seed we can grow in Europe, uh, and uh, that opened up the European market for US soya growers and, um, and eventually opened it up for uh, South American soya growers. So um, politics has decided that we will import our, a lot of our animal proteins from across the Atlantic. It makes no sense at all. It's, uh, it's nothing to do with sustainable development. It's nothing to do with good husbandry. It's just a political stitch-up mechanism. Yeah. That's where the soil really started to take off, and you can see it's in the grass, which is So, um, and, and with it, chemical glyphosate use went skyrocketing as well. So, so you will get the, the big difference between non GM and GM uh, soya beans is that you'll certainly get glyphosate residues in uh, GM ones. And to facilitate that, M Monsanto. Uh, engineered an increase in the maximum level that was permitted in soybeans uh, by 200 times before they started even growing GM soybeans. Very clever. So they've done the job before they even got them on the market. So. But although here we might be talking about pigs, actually the Nocton dairy, which was going to be for 8,000 cows, that got then reduced to 3,000 cows and then knocked out, i.e. The, the council said no, they're resubmitting that proposal because that's the way, apparently, that meat is produced today. And we have to join the competition or our farmers will go bankrupt. So basically what I'm saying is that we have to look at protectionism. We have to protect our farmers to produce the type of food that we want to eat. And not all the time have to put up with cheaper coming in from abroad and people's 
because they're not allowed to know the truth, they just get shown cheaper product and they buy it. So we need to inform the public, but we also need to have policies that protect farmers that are producing food in a way which is healthy, good for the environment, and good for your children and future generations, not just this corporate greed. There's also a huge um, suicide rate in India caused by GM and Monsanto. Yeah, the... Huge, I mean, unbelievable figures, like 160,000. There is a new report out just this month that's clearly showing that where Indian cotton farmers are persuaded by Monsanto's company in, in India to go down the uh, uh, GM cotton route, then um, they get into much higher levels of debt. And if the crop doesn't deliver a higher yield, which is as, it, as they were sold it in the propaganda, in the advertising, then uh, they're in trouble. And it, the evidence is that it doesn't deliver a higher yield and that yield has not really gone up at all. So they, they're putting more money into seed, not getting the higher yield that they, that they, uh, that they expected, and therefore the stress caused by um, them, for them debt results in them committing suicide, and that's a very common thing in, in small-scale cotton producers in India. It has been for some time. Well, this was another task you didn't know I'm sorry, I think you were thinking, but Channel 4, again, I was a party, I go to very few parties, but um, I went to one the other night, or several Channel 4 people were, and somebody was making a documentary about those deaths, or wanted to, and it was wiped, the idea. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's a massive story. I mean, they said to me, why don't you do this story? There was a, a, also a massive, a horrible. Mystery death yeah. of, uh, of, of, cattle, uh, of cattle, sheep and goats, when they were put on to graze GM cotton stubble, there was a very high um, death rate and illness rate amongst these animals that nobody's ever got to the bottom of uh, and shown what was causing it. But obviously, it's something that if it happened in this country, there'd be all hell broke loose and a massive investigation. But because it's India, then, um, you know, who, who worries, really? And that's, you know, that's the attitude that, that pervades, really, that there isn't that sort of level of scrutiny that goes on in the fields which there should be. Um, to find out if there is any harm from these crops or, and chemicals associated with them. But why are they told not to put um, factory pig manure on the vegetables? No. Factory farm pig manure on the mm. vegetables. Because you get diseases like E. coli and salmonella. Because it's come from the feces of the animals in those sheds. Those animals have been fed antibiotics. So the bacteria mutates to be resistant to that antibiotic. So they become antibiotic resistant bacteria that's on the feces that then gets put onto sometimes organic, and actually that big scare with the spinach in America, it was because it, the um, cow feedlots were um, above, were upstream of where the spinach got contaminated, and it's because the farmers were putting that manure from the water system onto their food. It's particularly big manure that they suggest we have. Yeah, because the pigs get so much antibiotics to keep them alive in these really, really appallingly bad conditions. So it's a, it's a wheel that won't go around because pigs say that we need the phosphates back onto the... Well, we need small, small pig units. The, uh, well, we need, we need pigs to be part of the rotation. And at the moment, they're in a shed thousands of miles away from where their feed comes. You can't use it anyway. Oh, I think if we, if we were using, if we had a small scale pig unit and we were feeding pigs locally grown uh, feed Protein, yeah. and, and also swill, then it would, be, it would be fantastic to be able to recycle that manure back into the ground. I mean, putting a, a herd of pigs onto a field that she's infested with weeds is one of the best ways of cleaning it up. You know, you just, they just dig it all out, eat it, and then two years later you can come back and grow a cereal crop on it. You know, so it, it does work. And that's, that's what used to happen. Um, but, you know, we've, 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 we've got a huge job to do because we've, we've removed all the hedges in, uh, in, in East Anglia and now we've got to you know, reinvent how we keep pigs in, in, in their place, you know. So, so there's a, you know, lots, of, lots of science to be done and lots of practical agron agronomy to be worked out how we're going to incorporate all this system back in. So we're not losing nutrients from the system. At the moment, it's... Uh, as I said, it's a throughput system, you know, South America, pig farm, North Sea. And um, if that happens in Poland, 
then the Baltic is dead, effectively. And there are, there are dead spots in the Baltic already as a result of runoff from Sweden. And if, if Poland, which largely drains into the Baltic, were to go intensive farming, um, pig units, intensive arable, then all that nutrient would end up in the Baltic.